who is doing the constructing. Uh, at the very end of the book, uh, I ask the question, do you need someone to actually be constructing this or could it be happening, could it happen by itself? So when you look at the numbers, uh, emptiness, let's say you have emptiness, do you actually need somebody to construct the number zero and construct the number one? Or could it happen in some realm that we are unaware of by itself? Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with Manil Suri about his engaging, insightful, profound, and whimsical new book, The Big Bang of Numbers, How to Build the Universe Using Only Math. Manil, it's great to meet. It's great to be here. Thank you, Robert. I love the book. I, I learned what I thought I already knew, uh, which is the best kind of learning. <laughs> um, and profound and whimsical, two words that occurred to me, is kind of a rare combination. It, it, I'm sure that was deliberate. Yes, I mean, I really wanted to make uh, it as humorous as possible and also as whimsical, as quirky as possible, not a, not a textbook, in other words. Yeah, well, I think, I think you, you succeeded on, on both the profound and the quirky. Uh, you, you said that the inspiration from the book developed from uh, the impassioned reaction to your op-ed in the New York Times uh, several years ago uh, called How to Fall in Love with Math. How, how did that work out? So uh, this was an article that I wrote. Um, it, it was, I think, in, in, in maybe 2016. I, I can't even remember. But um, it was something where uh, people, whenever they say do the math, they really mean do the arithmetic. And I wanted to tell people, hey, math isn't all about arithmetic. It's really about ideas. Uh, people often equate mathematics with calculation. And a lot of people aren't good at that. But is there something beyond that? And yes, most of math lies beyond calculation, where you're looking at uh, the way things behave, the way things change, uh, what, what happens in nature, what happens with games. And so I was trying to get all these ideas uh, into an op-ed and uh, ask people to look at these things beyond what they thought was mathematics. Let me give everyone a brief bio. Uh, Manil Suri is a distinguished university professor in mathematics at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He's the author of three award-winning novels, The Death of Vishnu, The Age of Shiva, and The City of Deva, which are three uh, Hindu gods, and we'll talk about that, translated into 27 languages. We'll talk about the novels later, briefly, but right now, the Big Bang of Numbers is a masterful reconstruction of mathematics, building up from first principles, building carefully, such that every move is clear, from sets to numbers to geometry to algebra. It occurred to me with something like Whitehead's and Russell's magisterial Principia Mathematica for mere mortals like me. And like me, I should say, I haven't read <laughs> Principia Mathematica. I'm, uh, you know, that's very intimidating. <laughs> I, I, I reviewed it when I, when I thought of this analogy with your book, and I was, again, very intimidated, even by the early chapters. And, and if you skim through it, all the pages look the same. It's all in symbolic logic, et cetera. But, but I, I really mean, it, it's not a joke, that the purpose of that was to build mathematics from first principles, and you do the same and do it in a very engaging way that I think everyone can, can understand. Then your book becomes, shall we say, more ambitious with applications to patterns like symmetry, physics, cosmology, and life. Uh, you're, you're not timid in your claims in the book. Yeah, maybe I went overboard. I don't know. I guess, uh, I guess you'll tell me. Uh, but <laughs> I think uh, the basic principle was to really map out mathematics in a completely different form uh, such that people can really tell where one topic ends and how that gives rise to the next topic because usually in school you know you get a little bit of algebra you get a little bit of geometry you get a lot of arithmetic and how do these how do these areas actually lead to one another so that was the main idea and then as as you said i sort of said well how far can i go with this thought experiment uh, can I really progress beyond mathematics into the universe? Can I uh, talk about how physics might come about? What infinity means? How life itself might form? And um, 
The answer is probably no, but I gave it a try. <laughs> we, we love that on Closer to Truth. Uh, speculation is terrific as long as we know the difference between speculation and what we know for sure. And the speculation has uh, real substance as its, uh, as its underlying mechanisms. And, and, and your book does for sure. Now, you want to give this reconstruction of mathematics, which I thought was terrific. Um, and, and you do it by asking what you call a deep, a deep thought question. I'm going to say, does math describe the universe or create it? That's the big framing question of your book, and it enables you to take this tour. So tell me about that question. Does math describe the universe or create it? Yes, yeah, so this is, this is an eternal question. I think it goes back all the way to Plato uh, in the sense that you know, if, if, if math describes the universe, it is then a human-made activity that we actually create in order to describe uh, all the physical phenomena with, that we see. If math actually creates the universe, then that is something that is some sort of intrinsic, I don't know if you want to call it intelligence or pattern or whatever order behind the universe. And so that is something that humans then discover because that is what's creating the universe. So um, I actually, in this book, uh, look at the second possibility. That is that math actually creates the universe. And uh, I feel that this is where the ideas are easier to bring across, uh, where you don't have the sense that you're getting something that's good for you. You know, often, often <laughs> when people are talking about math, they say, here, here is, here is a cell phone. It works on this principle. And let's look at the math behind it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a very, it's very interesting for a lot of people, but a lot of people also say, well, I don't want to know what's behind a cell phone. I just want to use it. So what I'm doing is I'm actually putting the reader that is yourself in the driver's seat. And I'm saying, okay, you're going to start with nothing and you're going to start building up math. And as you build up math, all these things will collectively enable you to actually build the universe as well. So if you progress along this path, you yourself will feel the need for geometry, uh, for algebra, for patterns. So it'll be not something that is given to you, but something that arises out of your need to build the universe. Between those two alternatives, describing the universe and creating the universe, you say that each has its own benefits and each has its own puzzles. So give me some feel for the pros and cons of each very briefly. Uh, for example, Eugene Wigner's famous phrase, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Yeah, so on the one hand, uh, take something like the golden ratio. Uh, the way that I'm looking at it, it is something that uh, is very enthralling to nature. And that's why uh, nature looks at this ratio, tries to imbue this in as many patterns as possible. And that's why it appears in so many things that you look at. Uh, the other, the obverse of that is that uh, when we look at physical phenomena, uh, there are patterns that emerge from that. And human beings have looked at those patterns, studied them, and that's where the golden ratio comes from. So it's two different ways of looking at things. Uh, either you know, patterns are something that, that, that are emerging from the mathematics and then uh, somehow coming into life in the universe, or we are looking at the universe and we are saying, hey, this thing is similar to this and that is similar to this, and we are looking at the underlying pattern and calling that mathematics. Just to give a, a, an example, a nautilus shell uh, is there and it certainly seems to represent golden ratio very well. But on the other hand, if we look at constellations, uh, in the sky where different cultures have embedded pictures of what they see as a bull or a dipper or things. Uh, I mean, none of us would say that that's fundamental to nature. Right. So uh, again, uh, uh, when we imbue things like what you, what you just said, uh, that's, those, are, those are less mathematical. Those are, you know, we have filled in the blanks. We have looked at these stars and said, okay, this looks like cancer or this looks like something else. And so uh, that's, that's clearly uh, a human imprint on the patterns that we are seeing. 
I'm talking about something a little more fundamental. Uh, I'm talking about uh, fractals, for example, which uh, we, we see appearing in nature. Uh, why do they appear? Well, there are various reasons for it. Uh, but I suspect that uh, this will become uh, more clear when we talk a little bit about how the book is structured. In terms of the big questions of existence and creation, you posit math as a worthy challenger to both fundamental physics and religion as the fundamental source of creation. Is math, you're making a challenge to the physicists and the theologians that here's a new challenger to, to, the, to the, uh, the, the fundamental reality of how it all came about. So um, I like that you say that reality tries to follow math's dictates as best it could, uh, which kind of reorients our, our, our priorities. Uh, give me some color about all that. Okay, so uh, I guess it comes from the basic idea of uh, creatio ex nihilo, which is creation out of nothing. And, uh, you know, both physics and religion try to do that. Uh, physics through some sort of singularity from which the uh, universe emerges. Uh, religion through, let's say, the seven days of creation as, uh, as you can find in Genesis. And uh, there's always some sort of trick to this. There's a magic trick. I mean, you don't really create uh, anything out of nothing. And that seems, you know, it, it, there's always... Uh, a supreme being, but then you come to the question of who created the supreme being. There's a singularity of some sort in physics who created that. So there's going to be a magic trick no matter what. So let's get that out of the way. And uh, if we are talking about magic tricks, mathematicians are great at magic tricks. So I'd like to uh, put in um, my, uh, you know, our uh, attempt at that as well. And our magic trick is, uh, is pretty innocuous in a way because we start with something called the empty set. Uh, I know now nothing is, you know, creation ex nihilo, nothing uh, has different meanings and different, uh, a different taxonomy even, but uh, what mathematicians begin with is something that is uh, close to nothing, but not quite it. Uh, but but just, uh, just to give you some more color, uh, I, I know it's a little brash, a little brazen, as you've said, but, um, you know, I'd like, I'd like mathematicians to get some of the credit, too. I mean, this is where the big attention getters are, you know, the big things in, in life, the big questions. And I feel that math also answers some of these. Mm. What I like about the Big Bang of Numbers is that what you get in the vast majority of the book is, is a scintillating, compelling, what I'd call a romp through the vast landscape of mathematics, organized very... Uh, uh, very logically. But you, as you said, you frame the story in contrast to the multiple origin stories of the universe from religious creation myths and all, all major religions have that to the Big Bang of scientists, you know, where do the laws of nature come from, laws of quantum physics, however you get back, you have to start with something. But you ask us to leave all those things behind and start from real nothing, no matter, no cosmos, not even empty space, and you ask, can we create the universe from only math? And so this is math's uh, origin story. Uh, you're creating it out of nothing. Now, your nothing is, is not what I'd call a total nothing because you still have the rules of set theory. I mean, I mean so, I mean, you know, that's yeah. your magic yeah. trick, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, it's, it's something that uh, I actually experienced when I was a graduate, undergraduate student way back in uh, the 1970s. Uh, where our algebra professor or analysis professor, uh, this was in the University of Mumbai, uh, told us about Kronecker's famous saying that God creates the integers and the rest is all the work of man. Uh, mm -hmm. In the sense that mathematicians can make everything once you have the integers, but those have to be God given. And then uh, my professor, his name is Huzur, Huzur Bazar and the, uh, the book is actually dedicated to him. Uh, showed us how with the empty set, he can create the integers as well. So that uh, he basically appeared in this godlike way. And, uh, you know, literally, I mean, not literally, but it really seemed like the room was expanding in some sense. And these numbers were just bursting from the construction that he gave me. So that's probably the closest I've come to a religious experience, perhaps. Uh, but it really felt like, hey, this is creation. This is what I'm looking at. 
And so that's the image that's always gone through my mind where you start with this empty set and from that, uh, it's something that's attributed to von Neumann. You can actually start creating uh, the number one, the number two and so on. Uh, but again, mathematicians, we always put our cards on the table. We are saying that we are going to use an axiom. Axioms are the basis of math. They're the basic fundamental building blocks. And we are saying we are going to assume the existence of an empty set. I, I was going to focus on that later, but as we're talking about it now, let, let's, let's make that. Because I think the key move is when you went from the nothing of the empty set and then encapsulated it, and that became one. So that, that is a very intriguing concept. And once you get that, then all else can follow. But let's drill down on that, that you encapsulate the empty set and that, that becomes the first integer one. Is that right? Yes, exactly. And of course, uh, underlying this is uh, a whole bunch of axioms in set theory, which uh, I'm not going to get into, certainly not in this book. But you mentioned the Russell Whitehead uh, tome, and that's where you would look up all okay. the actual assumptions, the underlying things that you don't quite see that are the magician tricks that we are putting in, uh, which enable you to start with this empty set and then create a set containing that. And that set containing the empty set is what we identify with one. So just the empty set is zero, but a set containing that is one. And then once we've got zero and one, well, you've seen, you've got yeah, two. That's it. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, and, then, that's, and then it just keeps going. Going from there is is uh, self evident and obvious, but that first move is really interesting. But you're telling me I've got to go back to Whitehead and Russell to really understand you, that. You can't escape it if you really want to delve into it. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll we'll, we'll wait till next time about <laughs> that. Um, now you say that math is the life force of the universe, a top down driving power, I'm quoting you, a top-down driving power that fashions everything that exists. So you say math is top-down. And I thought, why isn't math bottoms up? Well, it can be too. That's the whole thing. That's the other way of looking at math. When, uh, when you're given um, the universe and you're actually constructing math uh, to, to explain what you see, so that's what I think of as the bottoms up approach, the opposite way that from what we are doing. Uh, so the top down is where you start with nothing and then, well, I don't know, it depends. Maybe I'm looking at it the other way. You could call it yeah. e either way, I think. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends on your orientation. Because I always think bottoms up is what's more fundamental. But, but yeah, as long as you define the terms, we see that one is the opposite of the other. We'll, we'll agree with that. Okay. Who's north and who's south depends on right. which hemisphere right. you're in. Right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. top down means that you're doing the constructing. So I'm doing the math and then using it to actually uh, give rise to the patterns of the universe. Okay. All right. Now, here, here's, here's a question I want us to think about. Now, you say we invent math. It is not discovered. You put your cards on the table. You say math is not hiding in Plato's form heaven, right? Uh, sort of. It's okay. sort of a middle way. I mean, I'm actually taking a middle way because on the one hand, yes, we are inventing math, uh, but it's not the usual invention in the sense that we are looking at patterns and then inventing math for that purpose. So uh, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of in the middle. Yeah, because I, I was a little confused because then you say, obviously, yet math can create the universe rather than explain it. You're very clear about that. It creates it, not explains it. Uh, it, 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 it we're explaining something already in place. But if we invent math, how can it create the universe? It sounds, it's not backward causation. Well, so, so there's a section in the beginning of the book where... Um, I, I talk about this thought experiment and the best, uh, the best test of it, whether you could actually create everything using math, would be if you could scrub your brain clean and uh, have no inkling of the universe that we live in and then you know start with zero and then start inventing things and then create the whole universe. That's not gonna happen because we can't get rid of what we know already. Uh, so what I'm doing in this book is there are many things that uh, 
that that follow you know you look at you look at uh, the golden ratio you look at things where it's uh, manifested and you come up with a golden ratio well what i'm always trying to do is finding an independent path to all these constructions so starting with zero starting with the numbers can i then progress in some independent way to the golden ratio so that i'm not actually looking at the creations of the universe and extracting it from there but I have a clean path from what I'm inventing and then using it to get to where I want. So yes, I do have some inkling of where I'm going because there are many paths I could take otherwise leading to different universes. So to keep the experiment hinged, I have to actually have some idea of where I'm going, but I'm always uh, trying to get this independent path to it. And the fact that we invent math and yet math creates the universe, you don't find that a contradiction? Well, uh, again, uh, whenever you look at math, let's say, let's say you look at a typical proof in math, uh, that always says, you know, take, take, take the square root of x, double it, you know, do this, do that. And it's always a question to whom is that addressed? So a lot of math, it's when you're doing this construction, uh, the question is who is doing the constructing? Uh, at the very end of the book, uh, I ask the question, do you need someone to actually be constructing this or could it be happening, could it happen by itself? So when you look at the numbers, uh, emptiness, let's say you have emptiness, do you actually need somebody to construct the number zero and construct the number one or could it happen in some realm that we are unaware of by itself? And that's a very difficult question to answer. Yeah, it's so, a little like the observer in quantum physics and the big arguments uh, about do you, need, what, do you need an observer and what's an observer? Does it have to be conscious or can it be just another physical thing that it interacts with? Uh, so, you know, every, cre every creation myth, physics, religion, mathematics, they all have this address those same kinds of issues. Yes, exactly. So that's another uh, part of the magic trick, uh, something that happens be behind the cloak and uh, you know, curtains. <laughs> uh, and so uh, this, this is something that uh, comes up. Uh, there's a very interesting book by Brian Rotman where he actually asked this question. And also the following question, which is when you're trying to create all the numbers, who's going to actually create them? if you're going on to uh, an infinite set, like, okay, I can create these sets, I can write down these sets, zero, one, two, three, but what happens if I wanna keep going indefinitely? I can't do it, you can't do it. So who actually does that? And mathematicians very conveniently tuck in another axiom saying that you can do this for an infinite number of steps. <laughs> Now, mathematics, sets, numbers, shapes, logic, all of it is usually classified as abstract objects. And abstract objects are usually defined as being without causative powers. Do you agree with that? And if you do agree with that, how does that relate to your thesis? So uh, what do you mean by causative power? Uh, that, 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 uh, that there's no interaction between the abstract object and the physical world so right. that one can have a, uh, uh, an effect. Yes, I, I, I know exactly what you mean because this was a central problem which I came to uh, in chapter three actually, day three of this book. Uh, you know, I, it, was, it was okay to do arithmetic, do the numbers, uh, then I came to space and geometry, and uh, you know that was creating geometry, creating empty space. Fine, you can do that. Mathematics can do that. But then, when you come to how do you actually build anything? I mean, it's one thing to design things, but how do you actually build anything? Then you come up with the question that you just asked. Uh, everything that I'm doing is abstract. How is it going to get translated into reality? And um, the only thing I could think of is that you do need some sort of agent that will translate all those abstract things into something tangible, something physical. And uh, for that agency, uh, it, it, think of it as a contractor. That's, that's how I phrase it, that there's going to be some sort of contractor who's going to build the house that you've designed. Who is this contractor going to be? 
the one I chose, the only one I could think of was uh, the word nature, whatever that word might mean to you. Uh, some people would interpret nature as God. Some people would interpret nature as the laws of physics. Uh, but there's going to have to be a contractor. Okay, well, look, I think, I think that, that flows logically, at least as our finite minds can imagine it. But what that would mean um, is that your nature, which are the laws of physics on the one hand or God on the other, are a, um, uh, are, are a second level down from the real source, which is the mathematics. Right. So that, that would not do for the Judeo-Christian, the Abrahamic God, which is, who is supposed to be um, independent, a saity, they say, has independence, be, and that philosophers in, in the Abrahamic religions wrestle with how God deals with abstract objects. And they try have to reconcile how that happens because if these abstract objects are like the this infinite blizzard of propositions and logic and mathematics, God's head would be surrounded by these things. So they have to have God create those things, and that's a that's a hard thing to do. Uh, so so you're very clear that if there is a God, God is subservient to these abstract objects of mathematics. Yes, and God doesn't like it very much. Uh, in the sense that that's what I ascribe to all the randomness, to the little bits that nature puts in. Uh, you know, they're perfect patterns, a perfect triangle, a perfect fractal. None of these actually appear in our universe because God is putting their own stamp on it, uh, saying that, hey, this should be in my image, so I'm going to blur things a little bit so that people will call it something that I've put out. <laughs> Now, uh, some people who uh, would uh, propose math as the ultimate reality would then go on to say that all mathematically consistent, consistent systems create worlds, that everything that uh, could exist actually does exist in some sense, uh, um, like you know, David Lewis or Max Tegmark, each have their own their own variants of this. Uh, how, how do you come on that? Is the math that creates the world only the math in our world? Or are there other perhaps infinite number of mathematically consistent systems that on their, other, their, on their own can create other worlds? So certainly I, uh, that's one of the things that I want to impress on, upon the reader that if you start creating the world this way, you will come across places where you will you will have a branching. So there will be bifurcations where you could either choose this path or another path. And uh, this comes up from mathematics itself. Um, you know, th there's, there's a rich history of uh, axioms that have been suspect. Uh, the big example is uh, Euclid's fifth axiom, uh, parallel. the parallel postulate, uh, which says that if you are given a line and a point not on it, you can draw exactly one straight line through that point which passes in the same plane, uh, and that is parallel to the first line. And um, this is something that um, can be violated. You can have uh, in certain geometries, uh, no lines that pass through that point, and in other geometries, you can have an infinite number of lines that pass through that point. And uh, each of these gives rise to a very consistent geometry uh, examples of which we actually see in our own universe. Uh, so, so what I want to point out is that by choosing or altering uh, the assumptions that we have made, you actually do get, a, get consistent universes. Now, uh, whether they exist or not, uh, that is something that you know, obviously is an open question. As far as this book is concerned, I go back to that first directive that I had, that I am always going to choose the path that leads us uh, more directly to our universe. Hmm. And that's certainly uh, certainly a, a safe way to go, but it certainly oh, but 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 the fundamental idea that you have leaves open this larger question, um, and the question of does would these other mathematically consistent worlds exist, and it, it it exists in some in some other sense, not just conceivability, is an open question. Right, and 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 also I should just point out that. Even uh, in terms of our own universe, there are things that, very mathematical things that we don't quite know the answer to. Uh, I was talking about these uh, different types of space that can be curved when you don't have the parallel postulate. 
in our own space, is it, uh, is it plain? Is it planar in the sense of Euclid? Is it something that has a positive curvature everywhere? Uh, in which case it would be finite? Uh, or is it something which has a negative curvature? Uh, in which case it could be infinite. So these are things that, you know, the chances are it's probably plain, but we can't be absolutely certain. Yeah, this is the big question in cosmology, of course, whether the universe is closed and bounded or hyperbolic and, and goes on forever. And, and the evidence seems to be, but not sure that the, 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 the density of the universe is very close to that, th that uh, bridge between them to where it would be flat. But there are a lot, lot of little twiggles there, so nobody's really sure. So I want to get into the, the, the actual mathematics, spend a little bit of, of, just get a flavor for it. But before we do, I must ask you about your parallel life as an award-winning novelist. Now, I know novelists who are English professors, historians, philosophers, medical doctors, even spies, but I cannot think of another mathematician who is a novelist. So t tell me about your trilogy based on the three Indian gods as your, what are the themes, won prestigious awards. This is a, a whole other persona. Yeah, so it was something that, um, you know, writing has always been a hobby. And um, I think I was, uh, when I became a math professor, uh, you're supposed to only think about mathematics. And as a way to keep my sanity and rebel against that idea a little bit, I uh, had a whole secret life where I was trying to write stories, uh, going to writing groups and talking about writing and so on. And that that progressed to a point where um, I ended up starting a book uh, called The Death of Vishnu. Uh, and I was very lucky. I found an agent. Uh, the book did very well when it was released, lots of translations. And um, that's what got me uh, sort of more noticed than a mathematician. Most people would know me as a novelist rather than a mathematician. Um, in interestingly, uh, the main ideas that I looked at were sort of cosmic in, 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 uh, in some way. Uh, the death of Vishnu started with this one person whom I knew who used to live on the steps of the building in which I grew up on, in, and his name was Vishnu. And Vishnu, of course, is the, um, he's the, he's the preserver of the universe. Uh, so in Hinduism, Vishnu is one of the three main gods. Uh, Brahma creates the universe. Vishnu keeps it running and Shiva is often called the destroyer. So when this man whom I knew actually died on the steps, I decided to write a book about it. Natural name was the death of Vishnu, but then I was pulled into these cosmic questions of creation and preservation and uh, destruction. And so the three books that I wrote, um, they basically look at the cycle of you know, that's in the, in the background. It's a loose trilogy. They look at the cycle of uh, how, these, how this idea uh, plays out in Hindu mythology of creation and destruction. And I think this book, uh, The, God, the uh, Big Bang of Numbers, in some sense is looking at the same questions of creation, but from the mathematical side. So in some sense, it's a continuance of that. So in the book, uh, which is wonderful, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, you, again, pose this big question, does math describe the universe or create it? But you do that as a, not, as a pretext. I mean, you take it seriously, but it is a way to do a tour of basic math mathematics. So I want to take that tour. The book has seven chapters, which you call days, the seven days of creation, with channeling the book of Genesis uh, in the Bible. I'm, I'm sure everybody gets that. Um, and so let's start with day one, which I thought was one of the most interesting, because as you said before, you start with the empty set, you surround it, get the number one, and from there build. So I, I, I want to give everyone the, the sequence or, or the categories that you do uh, in that chapter, and then, then tell me how they relate together. So you have the natural numbers, then the, in, the integers, the rationals, the irrationals, the reals, the imaginaries, the complexes. So you have this flow uh, and build one on top of the other, and each one seems logical in its own, its own context. So g give me your sense of that flow. So here's the main thing. Uh, mathematicians, mathematics is often called a game. 
And so what I wanted to do was put the reader uh, in, a, in a place where they could actually play this game. The numbers are, uh, are alive in some sense in this book. So instead of just having them as you know, algebraic or, or symbols, they're actually going to have lives and they're going to play with each other. Again, the playfulness of mathematics. Uh, as they play with each other, uh, once you have all the uh, natural numbers, one, two, three, four, and zero as well, uh, formed, created, they start playing, well, what do they do? What kinds of games would numbers play? Well, addition, uh, multiplication. They, they can combine with each other and form new numbers. And the one thing they find is that they always end up with another natural number. One plus two gives you three, and that's already a number. Two times three is six, and that's already a number. So they're pretty happy that, hey, we've got this nice uh, playground, we've got this nice family, everything is complete. And then unfortunately, somebody discovers, some number discovers subtraction. And some of these uh, differences, six minus two, that works out to be four. Once again, that's another number. But when uh, you take two minus four, well, the numbers don't know what to do. There's nothing waiting out there for the answer. And they get kind of stuck and they don't know what to do. Uh, three minus six, stuck. Uh, four minus eight, stuck. So all these uh, pairs of numbers are all stuck up. And the only way to unstick them is to create more numbers. So that's where you get the negative numbers. That's the reason why you have negative numbers so that these numbers can keep playing their games. Uh, in the same way they start, someone discovers uh, division, which is the opposite, the inverse of multiplication. And once again, uh, six divided by two, no problem, that's three. But six divided by four and you get stuck again. So now you have to create more numbers and that's how you get to the fractions, to what are called rational numbers. And so there are different games that lead to more types of numbers. Uh, taking square roots leads to irrational numbers. Uh, taking square roots of negative numbers leads to imaginary numbers. And um, what I try to show is why all of these numbers, how they can be used in this pattern of mathematics. Uh, one of the big things is uh, randomness. You know, when you have our universe, where does randomness come from? Well, it comes from numbers like pi, which never end. But it's not a true randomness, it's a pseudo-randomness. So that's, that's all, all the stuff that happens on day one. Yeah, I like some of the names of your title, Searching for Their Roots, which is uh, 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 obviously a, a, a double play on, on the word roots. Uh, right. But this flow... Whereas I knew the meaning of each of these terms, naturals, integers, rational, irrational, real, imaginary, complex, but to see the progression as you do it was, was, a, was a real insight. The best kinds of insights are the ones that you, you, you feel after you've read it. Well, that was obvious, uh, but you didn't know it before. Right, yeah. <laughs> so those are the best senses, and I think that's one of the great aspects uh, that you do in the book. Uh, I like the fact that, that, that after you use the term irrational, you, you, you kind of said you, it sounds like a slur, right? If right. I call you were irrational, I mean, that's, that's not a nice thing to say, but you've come to like that term. Why? Yeah, because it's nice to have an irrational universe. You know, there's some quirkiness in the universe. Uh, numbers aren't all buttoned down banker types. You know, some of them are quirky. <laughs> They're going to do weird things. So you want that. You want the randomness that irrational numbers give you. Yeah. So what's the difference between uh, uh, real randomness and pseudo randomness? Yeah, so, so, so the problem with uh, randomness that you can get from the number pi, um, they've done lots of tests and they have found that um, more or less the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 9 are kind of randomly distributed when you look at the expansion. So you could say that, hey, I'm going to pick the 54th digit and uh, you know, if it's a zero, I'll do this. If it's a one, I'll do this and so on. So you could start picking uh, numbers from the decimal expansion and you could say that's a random uh, number generator. Well, except it's not because you know perfectly uh, that this number is predictable. You know exactly what the next number is gonna be. You just need to take the uh, decimal expansion of pi and everything is encapsulated in that. So uh, you can't quite call it a random number. Uh, for many uh, purposes, uh, the randomness that it has is gonna be enough. 
Uh, if you're trying to shuffle cards or something for a game at home, that's fine. But for some applications, you really need a higher level of randomness. And for that, uh, from what I understand, uh, that has to develop from some physical phenomenon, something like uh, a nuclear uh, atom or a molecule that's somehow disintegrating uh, or something like that. So some physical phenomenon, uh, something like electrical disturbances. Uh, and so that kind of randomness can only come if you have the universe already, not if you're trying to create the universe like we are doing. Hmm. Day two or chapter two is geometry. Uh, you start with the, the painter Kandinsky says everything starts from a dot. Uh, so bridge the gap from uh, arithmetic uh, on, on day one, the, the, uh, uh, the, the numbers uh, to day two geometry. So uh, the way I bridge that gap is that I'm continuing this idea of the numbers being alive. Uh, so now you need, you know, you know, where are the numbers existing? I mean, they're playing all these games, but they don't really have any place to play them. So I need to create uh, what I call condo units. I need to have each number have its own unit so that it can go in there and rest and so on. Um, and uh, for that, you need something more. You need a point, you need a location. Uh, so, so remember, we are always tallying up any extra assumptions that we have to bring into our creation. Um, now we had the empty set. Now we're going to add something called the point. Uh, and that's a location, uh, a location that I assigned to the number zero. Well, I need two of them. I need something for one as well. So I need a second point. Once I have these two points, I'm going to think of it once again as another axiom. This is something that comes from Euclid. Euclid said that if you have two points, you can connect them with a line. I'm gonna think of this line as consisting of an infinite number of points. So a line is just made up of these, this multitude of points. Uh, you connect these two, and moreover, Euclid's second axiom said you can actually uh, extend this line all the way up to infinity on either end. So I get this infinite line from, from those two points. Well, how do you get into two dimensions? If I look at these points, all the real numbers, zero, one, pi, one half, everything can be settled on this line. But what about, what about the complex numbers, the imaginary numbers? They don't have any place to go. And so because of that, I'm, I'm able to talk about, hey, there must be something more to this geometry. There must be a second dimension. And that's how I create the plane just as a way to settle these numbers. We're getting very upset because some, some guys have condo units and they don't. So you need to make sure all your children are well settled. What I liked about the description of the complex numbers is that y y y one can think, well, I just need an a, a y axis in addition to an x axis and I can, I can deal with that with two, two numbers, uh, two, two, two points. Uh, uh, to describe any point on a two-dimensional plane, and the same with the z-axis to three-dimensional. But um, but your your point is that with complex numbers, in a sense, you need only one number, like three three i or something, as opposed to two numbers, and so that gives a, an an additional sort of justification of the meaning of complex numbers. Yeah. So complex numbers has two parts: a real part and an imaginary part. So and again, in some sense, it's a combination of two numbers. But when you look at the complex plane, you can think of each point corresponding to a unique number, a unique complex number. Um, and there are subtle differences between that and just a two-dimensional xy plane. Uh, I can't call it xy because we haven't come to algebra yet. So <laughs> I'm careful not to bring up any xy or anything like that. Uh, that's going to be the next step. Okay, day three was algebra. I, I love the uh, clever puns of your, of your titles, the joy of X and the Y of things. The Y of things, right. <laughs> so between so, the, the uh, joy of X and the Y of things, I mean, that's, that's all we do in life. <laughs> yeah, so and, and it's actually back to your favorite, which is nothing, because uh, the way I think of algebra is it's a language that you're gonna be using in order to communicate with your contractor. Uh, so you're gonna be able to tell this contractor about all the shapes that you're trying to create. But the basis is X. And of course, uh, 
When you think of what is the symbol X, well, the way I get to that is that these numbers are playing games and they have an empty space. When you have an empty space, you can think of any number filling it. So, you know, kids often play these games, think of any number from zero to nine, and then, you know, come up with some sort of formula and try to guess what that number is. Well, when you have an empty space, it's actually this nothing in, in, another, in another form because this emptiness can be filled by an infinite number of possibilities. It can be filled by any real number. So X is a remarkable uh, development. It's a remarkable symbol because it can stand for a whole infinity of things. Uh, if you're trying to draw a line, for example, Y equals 2X, you can express it as a single direction if your X just double it. Well, imagine if you had to actually plot each and every point or specify each and every point on a line. You'd have to do it for each and every value of X. Well, X, the way algebra works, allows you to just do that in one instant. So it's a remarkable invention just from that point of view. Day four is patterns. And what I want to do now is just give a flavor of each of the subsequent days or chapters. And so with patterns, what, what is it about math that evokes the sense of beauty? So uh, there's two ways that people have, you know, two main ways. One is, one is symmetry. Uh, and mathematicians often count the number of symmetries an object can have and say, hey, this, this object is more beautiful, a square is more beautiful than a rectangle because it has more symmetry. Um, another way that people talk about math and beauty is, we've already talked about the golden ratio, that there are certain rectangles that are more pleasing to the eye. And uh, one of the nice things that I did there was take the Mona Lisa and uh, give her a mathematical makeover, make her more symmetric. And she turns out to be quite horrifically ugly when you make her face all symmetric. But then a weird type of beauty starts emerging when you continue that process. So, so that's an interesting uh, kind of thing that math tells you. Yeah, it's, it's a favorite word. We've dealt with it on Closer to Truth. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like the uh, Supreme Court definition of uh, pornography. Uh, <laughs> I, know it, I know it when I see it, but it's very hard to define. Yeah, I tried that same trick, you know, make, uh, make uh, Trump and uh, Biden. I took those two pictures, the presidential uh, portraits, uh, and they scare, you know, many people would be scared with at least one of them. And I symmetrized them just like I did with the Mona Lisa. And they become very harmless. You can hang them on your wall. They're nice little <laughs> circles. Uh, well, maybe we should get a third career for you in politics. Right. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm angling for that. <laughs> I can see not too hard. <laughs> on day five is uh, physics. And, and this is kind of a a big chew at this point because physics is its own world, uh, has its own, and uses mathematics uh, very strongly. But now you're reversing uh, who who who's the daddy and who's the son. Yes, and this is the point where I really started sweating in the book uh, because, as you said, physics is a big chew. How am I going to put all of physics into this little volume that I'm trying to uh, create? And so luckily a mathematician came to my rescue and that this is the mathematician Hilbert, who in about 1900 formulated 23 open problems. One of which was that all of physics, not all of it, but the more computational parts of it should be deri derivable from axioms, just like mathematics is. So what Hilbert postulated were, they have to be these basic axioms of physics from which you can build everything. And there's been a lot of work done in that. It hasn't been completed, and maybe it can never be completed. But I kind of palm it off and say that, okay, so let's take Hilbert's helpers, and they're the ones who are going to do this for us. And I kind of, you know, talk a little bit about how some physical problems, physical laws, like the law, inverse square law of gravity, actually comes from the mathematics, from the geometry. I thought that was very good, because as the uh, sphere grows it, it the, the reason we have this one over r squared or r cubed is because of the nature of of the geometry of the of the circle or the sphere exactly it's the surface area of the sphere so that's where it comes from uh day six is infinity which is a wonderful topic uh um and, and i just like you to reflect on the 
the endless hierarchies of infinities on, on the one hand and the, the undecidability of the continuum. Explain what that is on the other. So what happens is what Cantor found was that um, infinity doesn't just come in one size. I mean, we are usually used to the idea of one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, and you go to infinity. That same kind of infinity appears when you have fractions as well. Turns out that all the rational numbers, the fractions, can be listed. You can actually write down a list with all the fractions, calling this the first fraction, this the second, this the third, and so on. So you can match them with the fingers of an infinite hand, so to speak. However, when you come to the real numbers, and the best way to think about this is in terms of instance of time. If you think that between any two instances of time, there are an infinite number of other instances through which you live. And then somebody asks you, can you number these instances as the first instant, the second, the third, the fourth, going from, let's say, this hour to the next hour? You cannot. Uh, and that's what Cantor proved, that the infinity of instants that you have, the infinity of numbers in any interval, is actually larger than the infinity of the counting numbers. So you can't really count them. And you can actually repeat this argument, and you can find that there are even higher infinities. So there's an infinity of infinities. There's a hierarchy of infinities. And these just keep growing larger and larger. And for me, that is an amazing uh, metaphor for mathematics. There's going to be, you, you can never uh, finish, you can never be done with mathematics. There's always going to be more questions. Well, one of, the, um, one of the key questions that arises, which Cantor, George Cantor, spent a lot of time on, was could there be an infinity that is in between the counting infinity of the numbers one, two, three, four? and the continuum infinity, that is the continuum of points in uh, an interval or of instance in an interval of time. And he asked the question, could there be an intermediate in infinity? The continuum hypothesis says that there cannot be such an intermediate infinity. Unfortunately, you can't prove that. Cantor tried many times and he got so frustrated, he had to be hospitalized uh, several times because of that, and eventually gave up mathematics completely because of this one question. And it turns out he was on to something because that is an undecidable proposition. Uh, if you are given the rules that we use to consider mathematics, that proposition, whether you assume it's true or false, makes no difference to anything else. And that's why you cannot actually decide whether it's true or not. So is that been proven? Has it been proven that it is undecidable? Yes, that has been proven. Yeah, that was proven several decades ago. And that's a significant uh, development in mathematics. It, it, yes, it is. And this is, of course, related to the uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which says that if you have any set, uh, any, any kind of mathematical system where you have arithmetic, you can't uh, always answer all the questions that you can pose in that system. So there are always gonna be questions, which even if they're true, you won't be able to, you won't be able to actually prove it. Uh, many people, many mathematicians feel the continuum hypothesis is true. Uh, that is, there is no intermediate infinity, but they also accept the fact that we can never prove it. Uh, and that again is uh, metaphorically very interesting because it's saying that this you know, almost perfect system known to mankind, which is mathematics, that is something that you can't actually nail down everything with it. So we can't. Ex so in some sense, you know, trying to nail down everything with physics or anything else is probably also futile. That's what I feel. Day seven is emergence. Now God needed to rest on the seventh day, but not Manel, not you. you. You're going right on. You don't have to rest at all, right? Well, I do actually. I do get to rest, uh, and the reason for that is that. Throughout the book, we keep seeing these input-output processes where, um, where you start something, uh, you have some sort of input, and then you do something mathematical to it and get an output. It's sort of like uh, punching in a number, pressing a calculator key, and getting an answer. And then taking that answer and putting it back into your algorithm and going round and round with that. Uh, so these input-output processes 
Once they start, they can run on autopilot. And so the rest that I feel will come on day seven is when these have been launched and they're going to just create everything in the background and Manil can have a nice nap having written this book. <laughs> And so why do you call that emergence? Emergence, at least in physics, has a very particular uh, um, uh, concept in terms of not being obvious in terms of its reduction. And there's weak emergence and strong emergence, where weak emergence looks that way, but it really does uh, 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 rely on its uh, uh, fu fundamental uh, laws below. And strong emergence, if such exists, some people say that's impossible. Many people say it's possible. Uh, strong emergence, where in principle, it's, uh, it's, uh, you cannot reduce something to its fun the, the, the lower laws. So why is then emergence the word that you use uh, for day seven? So by emergence, what I mean is uh, a pattern or something more complex perhaps that arises uh, from very simple rules. So this is one of the key uh, insights that I feel mathematics gives to the whole idea of creation that starting with very simple rules, you can get a huge complexity of behaviors. Uh, let me give you an example. A very simple example is that, let's say you have all these particles that are facing in random directions and are concentrated at one point, and you, you ask each of these particles to move one centimeter away from where they are. Uh, so this, this kind of disorderly bunch of particles that are every which way, when they move apart, what do they form? They form a, a nice sphere because, because of the randomness, you actually get this order out of things because they've all moved one centimeter apart. So you get a sphere of uh, center of a radius one. Uh, there's similar examples that uh, happen with uh, insect intelligence where by following very simple rules, you get these types of behavior that you say, hey, is that real? Is that, I mean, do these insects actually have intelligence? Uh, another simple example is where ants are looking towards uh, trying to find food. They might have several paths that go to that food and they have this thing where they uh, drop little, uh, what are they called? Fer Pheromones. Pheromones, yeah. Pheromones. So, so that's what they drop. And as they go along, and uh, the ants that have a shorter path, there'll be more ants, they'll, they'll take less time. So even though an equal number of ants might go on all these paths, the ones that have a shorter distance, you'll find that more of the scent will be along that. And since ants will follow the scent, soon enough, they'll only be going on this shortest path and the other paths will have faded away. So it's things like that, yeah. Manil, so as I hear it, the emergence you're talking about is sort of the the natural development of uh, as the number system as you've developed the entire thing works it works itself given that there is this this actualization through through the contractor or whoever the contractor is that you can you can you can then sit back write your novels and it'll it'll the mathematics will, will go on. There's a different kind of emergence that is considered in the world of, uh, of physics, biology, uh, neuroscience, where there are fundamentally different principles that have to, um, that have to emerge or to have to occur at different hierarchies of organization in the universe. And without that, there wouldn't be and so self-organization or things having to do with consciousness are, are emergent qualities that unless there was some kind of law, whatever that might mean at different levels, that would be impossible. But what you seem to be saying is that things would just develop. Are you excluding the possibility that there must be some additional um, uh, regularities at different levels of hierarchies? Well, uh, I think at least the parts that, uh, the, the things that I've read about often talk about, uh, for example, a catalyst. There has to be some sort of catalyst that brings together, you know, the, the let's look at the emergence of life, for instance. Uh, they have to be the right ingredients. There has to be a lot of uh, randomness where these ingredients can uh, interact with each other. And then some theories talk about a catalyst that will increase the probability of the right molecules forming. Uh, 
I think as far as this book goes and as far as the mathematics goes, I'm only claiming that mathematics can uh, facilitate some discussions like this in terms of showing how you can get complexity out of very simple rules. That's as far as we are going. Manil, The Big Bang of Numbers is a great book. As I said, I have new appreciation from what I thought I once knew. Now I understand it at a deeper level. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. Closer to Truth, we promise, will follow Manil as he champions math's cosmic battle with physics and religion for origin supremacy. Viewers can watch Closer to Truth's 22nd season, which will focus on mathematics, its powers, purposes, beauty, and possible meanings. But that's next year, 2023. Later this year, 2022, is Closer to Truth's 21st season on scientific breakthroughs. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.